Hello, everyone. Yay. So I'm someone that thinks about a future with robots. And I would like it to be a future not where robots steal our jobs, but where uh, we create opportunities uh, to work side by side um, with robots. Um, and when that happens, and it has already begun happening, as we heard earlier, uh, the future is already here, just not well distributed. Uh, we are going to need better interfaces with machines. Uh, we are fundamentally social creatures. And as soon as we see technology, uh, we treat it socially as well. Therefore, this talk is a call for robot body language. So a quick, quick map through what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to bring you up to speed on the future that's already here uh, with robotics. And then we're going to talk about social machines. And I'll go into my current work, which is on expressive motion. So this could be a component of a, a future world where <laughs> robots can interact with us naturally, uh, meeting us in the middle instead of us all learning to program, uh, although that's fun too. Uh, we can make the robots come to us and adopt some of the ways that we communicate with each other. And uh, one of the ways that I'm hoping to break through uh, in terms of making some of this uh, better, faster, is by collaborating with people from theater. Uh, and uh, I'll finish with some applications for a, a fun future with this work. So some of you may already know, uh, but there is an incredible amount of investment in collaborative robots, in particular on the manufacturing line right now. Uh, so industry thinks that it is the moment for people and robots to be able to share space. So uh, traditionally, factories tended to have uh, uh, the lights side of the factory where the people worked, and then the dark side of the factory where you didn't need any lights because the robots were all uh, doing things autonomously. And so uh, in car manufacturing right now, I, I got a chance to visit Volkswagen's headquarters um, in the fall. Uh, it's about 50-50. So there's the part where the robots do uh, the pressing of the metal and uh, the painting and, and you know, put them in big, big vets. And, and then there's the almost finished car that mostly gets uh, sewed together uh, by people. Um, the electronics are wired by people and so on. Uh, so robots have trouble doing things like uh, placing the car, uh, placing the seat into the car. Um, and so right now, with the state of computation and sensors, we think that it's safe to, to do better than that. So uh, I would say we're moving uh, from a world where robots operate behind closed doors or in faraway places, uh, the dull, dangerous, and dirty tasks, to a world where we have robots in our hospitals. Even if they're just service robots delivering uh, linens or samples, they're cleaning our homes, they might greet us to new spaces. Uh, help in healthcare. There's new types of toys. Uh, I love this picture of uh, a, a missing drone poster. It's from Washington, D.C. A hobbyist is playing with a drone. He lost it. He's quite sad. He's offering a reward, much like a lost cat. So a challenge that you might not have uh, thought about, about a robot uh, in a human environment, is that we have to start thinking differently than a traditional engineer. It's no longer about the shortest path from A to B, or uh, you know, the fastest path. Sometimes uh, when you put human into the equation, um, it is what is most socially valuable to people. Uh, so there was a, a great uh, ethnographic study of uh, robots in a hospital setting. And on a maternity floor, it was just delivering its linens. It was fine. People are like, oh, this is the best robot. This is so sweet. It's great. We should have robots in all hospitals. Same robot, same behavior system running on a surgery ward where it's life and death scenarios, nurses and doctors running through the corridor, and they're like, why doesn't it know to move out of the way? Like, this is people's lives we're playing with here. They kicked the robot, they hated the robot, they just thought it was completely awful. And so robots need to be able to adapt to human context. So uh, one definition for robots is sense, think, act. And in a world where we have robots interacting with people, I would like to reframe this as Sensing being the robot's ability to perceive and interpret human behavior. Thinking as the constant character or, or characteristic, style, personality of that robotic system. And action as the ability of a robot to enact things in a way that people can interpret, that, that helps uh, smooth the overall engagement between person and machine, whether it's on a collaboration together or whether you're just sharing that hallway. And so this 
requires a call for social machines. And one thing that I think is very fun about understanding humans' social response to machines is we might also be able to program them not to be social when that's the more appropriate scenario. So for example, if I am an elderly person and I have to do things like get help going to the bathroom or changing with the robot, maybe I want my privacy, so I don't want this to be a social character. So we can also use some of these methods to design robots that seem more like machines. But to do that, of course, we have to understand the difference between what makes us as people treat a machine as an agent or an object. And it turns out it doesn't, it doesn't have to be something that looks like a person for us to start to anthropomorphize its behavior. I should tell you, go over what anthropomorphism is. So the attribution normally of human characteristics to a robot, but let's expand that definition a little bit. And so this is a creature-like agency. So this idea that the robot is making decisions of its own, that could be uh, you know, the furniture in Beauty and the Beast that comes to life. So it's the uh, characterhood of a robot. So it turns out one of the key features in anthropomorphizing robots is motion. It has a neurological basis. There we have things that uh, some people call mirror neurons uh, that may be uh, us uh, enacting motions that we see through our own uh, motor circuitry to try to interpret what they mean. And that can apply to drone motion. And it can even apply to the motion of very simple shapes. I'm going to let you watch uh, a minute or two of this video. This is some of the earliest work uh, by two psychologists in 1944 about how we attribute storytelling to the motion of, of very simple features. I'd love to recreate this with Roombas one day. <clears throat> so someone's a bully. <laughs> So I'll give away the results of the experiment at this very tense moment. <laughs> so there was not a single person that participated in this study that did not tell a narrative about what was happening here. Uh, the sequence of relational motion um, created a story over time, even though it was just uh, simple lines and shapes. And absolutely the same thing will happen with robots. Um, other neurosciences have since used a similar approach to show that people that do not have normal social development uh, may not attribute storytelling. So, uh, and that can be something that we can, can diagnose and then work with. So uh, the key difference here uh, between an agent-like motion, uh, sorry, uh, and the object likes motion is, so an agent is moving with intent. So it has some sort of intelligence and choice and in, in what it's doing. So if you think about a falling leaf, it has a pattern of motion. It's following the laws of physics. But if that leaf suddenly jumps off the page and, and starts uh, chasing a butterfly, it's an agent. So I'm going to focus on this idea of enactment. A robot completing its, for example, task motions in a way that you can understand what its internal state or motivations are. So how can it use how it moves in a way that communicates with people while still getting its job done? So it turns out uh, that if you have a really good way of doing this, so for example, if I steal a methodology from theater, and then I can translate this into quantitative param parameters that we can train or learn on a robotic system in a repeatable fashion, uh, the missing element is to just loop in people so that we can consistently understand how these motions will be uh, interpreted. So now we have programmers and we have human beings, and we are going to use the expertise of theater. Got all that? <laughs> all right. So this is the robot that I've been working with. My name is Copart. I perform tasks on the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th floors of the Gate Skillman Center. You can go online to request tasks for me to perform. Okay. with an email account can reserve it to take someone to a location, to deliver a message, 
uh, to live, deliver an object. It has a little basket. Um, so uh, I, I'm really interested in how robots that look nothing like people can still be expressive. So uh, what's fun about that is that means that all of these robots that are currently rolling out into our everyday lives um, can use motion. And it doesn't cost anything in terms of hardware to add this communication capability. So uh, let's look at the impact of expressive motion. I'm going to take a pre-existing task that the robot does. Uh, every year, uh, we run a, a reverse trick-or-treating Halloween uh, candy delivery, where the robot goes around to people's offices and delivers candy. So um, this is the program. Lots of, we learned all about loops right, in the music production earlier. So, uh, it goes to a floor, uh, and then it tries to deliver to offices, and then the next office, and the next office. That's a loop. Um, and each time, it randomly uh, has different motion parameters uh, so that we can uh, compare between how that affects whether people take candy or not. So I'm not going to talk about all of our parameters, but um, two of them uh, were uh, the robot's speed change uh, and its orientation towards the office door. So remember, it's delivering candy. It's offering you candy at the door. Um, and we're tracking. I, I built a little uh, hand detector so I could see when someone's putting their hand in um, to take candy. So that's good to be our, our feedback. All right, so I'll show you what it looks like. So the robots are not always in costume, but they are on in October. Um, so the slow speed you have right there. Um, you've got some nice billowing with a fast, yeah. Um, so here's the, what our, our data is all coming from uh, four different floors. Uh, uh, so some statistics about this data. The robots successfully visited uh, over 250 offices, <laughs> traveling over two kilometers. Kilometers, see what I did there? Um, right, uh, over four and a half hours. Um, and then the most Im impressive, I think, to me is that they ate, uh, we all ate 12 kilograms of candy. Um, yeah, and so we had a, a bunch of detections, almost 150. So again, we designed this robot. As this was, what's fun about this experiment is it's happening in a real environment. It's not a controlled office setting. And that means that sometimes unexpected things can happen. So as I told you, the robot is only offering candy when it gets to someone's office door. But a third of the candy taking happened while the robot was in transit. <laughs> Um, and unlike this particular video shows, over 80% of the uh, candy uh, taking in the hallway happened because the person stopped in front of the robot. They're like, oh, thank you. They're taking, they're taking the candy. They invite their friend over. Um, uh, they're talking to the robot. Uh, it seemed to be consensual. Um, and so basically, they, they interpreted the robot making a nonverbal offer of candy by the costuming, by the big basket of candy. Um, so uh, we don't always need the robots to talk uh, for uh, them to make their purpose clear. But uh, secondly, and fascinatingly, uh, the speed that the robot was moving at it had a large impact on uh, how whether or how much can whether people would take candy and how much candy they took. So basically, uh, if the robot looked like it was busy, people didn't want to interrupt the robot. So in the same way those surgeons got frustrated that the robot didn't know to move out of the way, it was impolite. People didn't want to be impolite toward the robot. There was also a trend towards when the robot approached the office at a higher speed for people to take more candy. So perhaps if it seems like it's important to the robot, you're more likely to go along with its request. <laughs> so there are a lot of people in a couple mile <laughs> kilometer radius from here uh, that are really good at expression. They're really good at creating characters for the stage that engage an audience or that tell a story. So why not borrow on some other methodology for motion? I'll go through very uh, briefly an acting lesson for all of you. Uh, so the Lebon effort system was a notation created to record human motion, much like a score for music, so you could replay a performance later in time without video, pre-video. Pre and as uh, a subcomponent of that, they said not what the motion was, I'm going to move my clicker from here to here, but how am I going to get there? And Laban identified four categories of motion characteristics as being important. So what your attitude towards the goal was when you got there? Is it a direct? Is it indirect? Uh, the time. Uh, do you look like you're in a rush? Do you have a sense of urgency? Or could you take all of the time in the world to get there? How, how are you using force? What's your relationship to gravity? and flow, which is sort of a meta-characteristic of the other three. Uh, 
So the way they defined that was actually inspired by Darwin. So there are animals that are the dominant animal. And there's the supplicant animal. So each of these efforts has two poles, that, uh, two extremes that the motion can run between. And so you can see, as a computer scientist, you can think about this as like a four-dimensional coordinate space um, and, and design uh, your expressions within that space. We won't go into too much detail there, uh, but I will show you a human example of just the space. So I have been working with people that specialize, for example, in Le Bon motion um, and also in studies with people to try to quantify some of these parameters. So I think this has a lot of interesting applications. So we talked about collaborative manufacturing before. Uh, it's very fascinating. Uh, I, I, I'm going to just do a really quick side note. There's been some really interesting work also in, in terms of uh, developing collaborative manufacturing applications in a virtual reality environment as well. So then you can play with uh, the safety regulations of how that robot moves um, without actually putting a worker in danger. But in terms of cre creating good camaraderie with the worker, being able to have effective social patterns and also be able to predict where the robot's reaching has already been shown in human studies to improve the efficiency and performance of a robot human team. We can also think about autonomous cars. This is a mashup of the Uber Google car. Uh, sorry if any of you are in the audience. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, I think that it will be very important for people to trust the motions of the autonomous cars that they're traveling in. I want to be able to anticipate the stop sign. I might want to be able to even turn up uh, the urgency parameters of how I'm pulling into an intersection or pulling out at, at a light uh, so that I could get to the hospital faster or if I'm late to work. There is a space of allowable motions uh, for all robots, basically, uh, to move within. And so exploring the expressive space within, within those, those adaptable features. You can have plus or minus five miles per hour um, on, the, on the speed limit. So it's very interesting to play with. And these are robot systems that are coming out right now. A second really fun place to put robots, uh, like the experiment I showed you before, is in real human environments. So I work at a university. Uh, so being able to create robots that are working in office spaces, um, that are released like these spear robots uh, at music festivals to interact with people is a great place to develop algorithms and gather data on how people interact with such systems. And finally, I think that there are venues like this. And my last talk basically at uh, Thinking Digital, this was the entire theme, how you could use audience members as, machine, uh, as data points for machine learning and develop uh, algorithms with people. Um, now I've been playing with some interactive performance strategies where you can basically uh, try out an interaction strategy on stage. And if it doesn't work, you can pull in people from the audience to propose new solutions for how the robot could move. And so you can develop this with real people um, to make uh, robots that people care about. <clears throat> so that's my vision of the future. I think uh, that I envision many roles for robots in human society. And I think that uh, theater collaborations will help them get the part. Thank you. Thank you.